Okay. All right, Shona, over to you. Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, we are really grateful to Dr. Susie Smile for joining us today as our guest speaker. Um, she is going to be discussing this wonderful topic of navigating the transitional challenges, uh, you know, when caring for, uh, you know, refugee Muslim foster youth. And we are really excited to have her here with us today and tap into her expertise. Uh, Dr. Susie is the founding director of Cornerstone. Uh, it is a nonprofit organization. It's a faith-based communication intervention organization. It's got several locations around the world and it focuses primarily on youth, family, marriage, identity, socio-emotional wellness and relationship building. Um, we have uh, sent out her bio to you, I can read everything, and I want to make sure that you know that she has traveled to the border of Syria to work in refugee camps with women, families, and orphans, and she continues her work with resettlement and relief agencies, providing uh, many integration uh, services. So I would like you to, um, you know, uh, take advantage of this wonderful talk and hear her speak and answer the questions you might have for her. And welcome, uh, Dr. Susie Smile. And thank you. Uh, we're grateful to you for your time. And uh, we'll we'll get started. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Shireen and Shona um, and everyone who's attending. I love the fact that it looks like we've got a um, a pretty full room. So this is exciting. Um, you know, the topic that we're talking about today, I think, is uh, incredibly relevant for all of us. But before we dive into the topic and before I tell you a little bit more about Cornerstone and what we do at Cornerstone, I just want everyone to take a second or two to just drop in the chat box the role that you play that has brought you to this, this uh, session. So whether you're a foster parent, maybe, whether you are a caseworker, um, maybe you work directly with unaccompanied minors or with uh, refugee children or the refugee population, or if you're just someone who's interested in the topic and maybe engages in, in other initiatives with the group. So just let me know who you are so that I know who my audience is and we can kind of try to direct everything that we talk about today and hopefully what will be most beneficial for all. So I'm seeing a lot of service providers, um, which is excellent because uh, I think this will hopefully uh, be relevant to you. I see some uh, education specialists, um, some caseworkers, some uh, therapists, yay. I see some uh, program directors, All right, wonderful. So I really appreciate you bringing in kind of this information and helping me get to know you a little bit better um, or in as much as we can know each other through virtual media. So, just to tell you a little bit more about the work we do at Cornerstone, Shona introduced you to some of the work that I do personally um, and my background, but as an international nonprofit organization, uh, Cornerstone kind of covers several different areas in the field of what we consider alternative therapeutic interventions. Um, and our focus is really on being able to provide um, a form of therapeutic intervention that speaks to uh, communities who may come from more of a collectivist background, which we're gonna talk about quite a bit today, um, and to reach communities in which traditional Western forms of therapy may be stigmatized and resisted. Um, and we offer all of our intervention programs and our education programs in 14 different languages. Um, so Dari, Pashto, Arabic, Tamil, Tigrinya, um, English, Swahili, uh, Spanish, and, and several other languages. And the focus is really on being able to connect with people from a culturally and faith-based perspective that speaks to where they are coming from. So our, our particular interest in the field of refugee work um, comes from uh, our understanding that for many of our forced migrant clients, um, refugees, asylees, parolees, um, SIVs, you know, uh, wherever uh, our, our forced migrants are coming from, uh, they are coming with several layers of trauma, of difficulty, of trying to transition and adapt. Now, if we add to those layers, the layer of being a child or a teenager, we know uh, already we are creating a situation in which there is going to be a great deal of difficulty in transition. So for today's session, we are going to focus on the particular population um, of young forced migrants. So forced migrants who are children, who are teens. And I understand that in the Michigan community, there is a large number 
um, of uh, teenage uh, uh, foster children who come from forced migrant backgrounds. Um, whether these children came as unaccompanied minors um, or these children came as, and I see a couple of URMs uh, that were coming up in the chat group, um, uh, people who work in that field, uh, but whether they were unaccompanied minors, whether they are, are forced migrant children or refugee children that have been removed from families due to uh, difficult situations, situations of DV or other issues, um, regardless of what the, the reason is for the fostering, we really want to focus on what your foster families may be seeing in the home in working with these children, what you may be seeing if you are interacting with the uh, children within the shelters or in that first stage, you know, in the safe havens prior to placement and the finalization of resettlement. And also we want to look at what we may be seeing with the new model, you know, as we move to community sponsorship and private sponsorship, and we see more and more families um, connecting with forced migrants and refugees and and bringing them in what, where we may see areas of difficulty, um, particularly for those uh, children that are coming from collectivist communities, such as those that are coming from Muslim faith backgrounds. Um, and we're going to talk again a little bit more about collectivism and what it means and, and defining it as we move forward. But I wanted to start us off with just a quick overview of, again, what are we seeing? We know that in the past two years in particular, we saw a rise in the number of unaccompanied minors that resettled in the U.S. Um, and it, with that rise of unaccompanied minors. Again, it, some of those situations were cases in which um, children were separated from their families during the evacuation process, during the uh, crisis, the refugee crisis from Afghanistan in 2021. Um, some of them are uh, children who were uh, kind of sent off in order to connect with families and that the family reunification process either hasn't occurred yet or is in the process of occurring or did not pan out. Um, and some of them, again, we've got so many different cases, uh, but we are seeing just, you know, many of these children, particularly within the past two years, we've seen a rise in the number of children that need fostering um, for a variety of reasons. So in terms of, of an overall view of what we are seeing with children in particular um, who need to be fostered, who are coming from forced migrant families, you know, I often start my talks on, you know, the refugee mental and emotional wellness and mental and emotional health uh, from the perspective of gaining a better understanding of the dynamics and what we're seeing. So again, I'm going to direct you guys to the chat box because we are a rather big group, so it'll be hard to uh, have enough time to cover our topic and, and have everyone joining in uh, verbally with microphones. So in the chat box, if you can just tell me with one word, when you look at this picture, what is the one word that comes to mind? The first word that is evoked when you look at this image. And just pop it in the chat box so we could see what kind of comes to mind when you first see this image. All right, so we got hardship, we got courage. All right, I know we've got like about 50 people in here. So <laughs> lots of words in the chat box. I see family. Okay, what else do we see? Um, we see, okay, somebody's describing themselves. Um, unknowns, transition, uncomfortable, sad, tired. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm loving the words that I'm seeing in here because what often happens when I pull up an image like this, and again, if you you know Google refugee or forced migrant, usually it's an image similar to this that comes up. A lot of times when I ask, you know, what is it that people see in this image, I'll, I'll get a variety of words as we're seeing in the chat box, but many of the words are words that feel very heavy. So words like sadness, fear, um, difficulty, struggle, hardship, which again, I, I see a lot of those words coming up here. And some of them are words that are positive in their connotation, right? So some of the words that I do see here is moving forward. Um, I see family, I see courage, right? But primarily, if we were to add up all of these words and the numbers, we see that a lot of the first impression that we may get may be heavily skewed towards difficulty, right? Terms of words that tend to indicate how hard it is for uh, a forced migrant to move and to kind of start that resettlement process to flee the country of crisis and to begin again. And what I always think is interesting when we look at an image like this is that if we were to look, for example, at the children's faces, um, despite the hardship that 
clearly is indicated, we also see what would be considered um, an upward movement of the lower facial muscles, which is indicative of some sort of positive emotion that's being exhibited. And over and over again, you know, part of my studies and then my area of expertise is, is deciphering nonverbal communication. And so this is kind of an area that I like to explore deeper, but nonverbally, we often see in this stage of flight, um, many times we see more of a positive connotation in terms of the nonverbal cues, particularly among children. And we see this because, you know, what we understand is that through this process, and often again, when you look at these pictures, we see a sense of community. There's not just one person that's fleeing, but even as you can see in this image, you see a family or you see several individuals together. Um, of course, when we see our unaccompanied minors, there may be a sense of collectivism in the flight uh, period of time or the flight transition because they are not leaving alone, but there may not be that connection with family because they may be leaving their family behind. And so when we take a look at an image like this, the concept of the positive connotative nonverbal cues links back to really the field of, of work that we do at Cornerstone, which is working on rebuilding resilience, particularly when transitioning through difficult times. And that's a big part of what we do in our refugee work. And the way that we do that is by fostering what we call spiritual, psychosocial, relational, emotional wellness. And I know that's a mouthful, and that's why we simply like to say we foster resilience, but essentially when you look at the components of resilience and what it means to be resilient, oftentimes the elements that create that, that emotional resilience are linked to spiritual well-being, psychological well-being, social well-being, relational well-being, which is a component of collectivism, the importance of having strong relationships with family, with friends, with community, and emotional well-being. And it's all of those components that go together in terms of trying to uplift a forced migrant community, and particularly when we're working with children. So as we move forward here, I want to start our conversation off with really understanding the heaviness and the depth of trauma that we are dealing with when we are working with refugee children, really at any stage. And this triple trauma paradigm applies to forced migrant or refugee adults as well. But again, we're going to tailor our conversation today, particularly towards the children and teens. So we know that when a forced migrant goes through the experience of crisis within the home country, the first level of trauma tends to be what we consider the pre-flight trauma. And this is the trauma that is linked to the fear of being in a place that lacks physical safety, that lacks emotional safety, um, and that lacks a sense of security. Now, imagine a child who is in this place of, of crisis, right? And especially if they are within the first stage, which is considered the age of security from the age of zero to seven, during this pre-flight time, there is a shaking up of the stability that children from a psychological standpoint need within those first years of development in order to, to really develop positive emotions, positive interactions, and that spiritual, psychosocial, relational, emotional wellness that we talk about. In this pre-flight stage, oftentimes the mind and the body kicks into survival mode. So not being able to process the emotions during pre-flight is pretty common, meaning and in that pre-flight, in the country of crisis, it's about how do I survive, right? How do I get the food that I need? How do I uh, stay safe? How do I make sure that my physical and physiological safety is intact? Now, we see a second stage of the trauma in the triple trauma paradigm, which occurs during the flight process, which is that image that we saw where, you know, during that flight process, there could be, of course, separation from family. There could be uh, the difficulties of crossing the border. There could be the difficulties of being able to reach a place of physical safety. Again, during this period of time, it's survival mode. So the mind, the body is not able to process the emotions that are kind of bubbling under the surface as the mind and the body is just trying to exist, trying to move forward. And so then we see the post-flight stage. And the post-flight trauma uh, stage within the triple trauma paradigm is where most of us come in as service providers and as caseworkers and as educators and as those who provide care to the forced migrants through resettlement. 
in that post-flight stage, this is where now the body may begin to feel a sense of safety. The, so the physiological needs may be met. There is a roof over the head. There is a sense of, you know, food being available. There is a sense of, you know, uh, physical well-being. When the body begins to feel this physical well-being, it's almost like a trigger to the mind to say, okay, now physically you're okay. So let's unpack the emotions. Let's unpack everything that you felt in that flight stage, the fear, the terror, the uncertainty, the experience of hardship. Let's unpack everything that you felt in the pre-flight stage, you know, that period of crisis within the country of crisis, the torture that you may have encountered, the loss, the grief. And it becomes almost like a flood of emotions that occurs in this resettlement stage in post-flight. And this is why so often with refugee clients, you know, we may see a client getting very agitated about something that is happening in resettlement that the caseworker or the educator may be like, what's the big deal? And an example I often use, and I know a lot of uh, uh, service providers in the field say, yes, that's happened, um, is for instance, you might have a, a refugee family, you might have a, a foster child um, who is a forced migrant, who you have provided them with a gift of some sort, you've uh, given them maybe a backpack, for example. And then suddenly, you know, the response to the backpack is, you know, this is not the color I want. Why would you give me this backpack? This is not the same as the one that the other child has. And there may be a flood of tears. There may be extreme emotional response. And in that moment, as care providers, as, as caseworkers, as being involved with the foster child, our response may be, you know, it's just the backpack, calm down, you know, uh, the color is nice, and we may focus on the backpack. But the reality is that emotional response has nothing to do with the backpack, that there is such large trauma that is difficult to unpack when the flood of emotions opens up, that the direction of emotion is redirected towards something that is more tangible. The backpack is something that the child can feel, can hold, can recognize that they can respond to this tangible item. But the feeling of loss, of grief, of loneliness, of lack of connection, of lack of home, of lack of identity, of lack of belonging, those are big traumas. And they're big traumas that are difficult to unpack. So we may be responding to, and I'm putting it in air quotes, you know, the little trauma and not understanding why this little trauma is occurring, when in reality, it's a redirection of emotion to, from a much larger trauma. And we see it again with a lot of refugee families when we help them through the process of resettlement, getting them into a home, maybe we're delivering a couch and the family may react very negatively to the color of the couch. And again, it's not about the color of the couch, it's about the bigger trauma. Now, with children, of course, we know that the emotions may be even more intense than what we see with adults, because we've got the lack of regulation of emotions, which occurs through the stages of growing up, but we've also got the trauma component. So you're kind of bringing these two together as the children are transitioning into the new environment. Now, from a psychological standpoint, when we look at the stages of development within children, we tend to see these, you know, roughly, the, the ages are not exact, of course, but roughly a division of three different stages in terms of emotional wellness and emotional response. In the first stage of development, when a child is between the ages of zero to seven, we view this as the age of security. Again, this is the stage where stability tends to be one of the most important factors. Um, it's also the stage where role modeling behaviors often occurs. And this is why parental care during this age of security is so critical. And we know again that for many of the unaccompanied minors, for many of the, the forced migrants that are children, there is you know, a lack of security during this first age. And what this tends to lead to is we see an increase in uncertainty avoidance. And we're going to talk a little more about uncertainty avoidance, um, but this uncertainty avoidance relates to how an individual responds to uncertainty. Those who tend to have strong bases of security in the first stage of development tend to have what we'd consider a balanced uncertainty avoidance, meaning they're comfortable with uncertainty to a certain degree, but they're also you know, not comfortable with complete uncertainty. 
So how does this manifest? Let's say you're fostering a child and the child has uh, a school assignment and you know, you're trying to encourage the child to complete the school assignment and they're just not doing it, right? There may be a lack of uncertainty avoidance or a lower uncertainty avoidance because of the prioritization. Living during the age of security in a time that was not secure, maybe in the country of crisis, maybe ex experiencing pre-flight or flight trauma, causes the level of uncertainty at times to go either way. Either there's this fear of like, what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen tomorrow? Or a feeling of, well, who knows if tomorrow's even going to come? So why do I need to worry about tomorrow? And we do tend to see a little bit more, particularly, you know, when it comes to education, academics, um, things that, you know, that are task oriented in children who are forced migrants that have struggled through that age of security. We tend to see an increase in more of that approach of, ah, you know, I'm not going to do the assignment. I'm, you know, you told me to clean my room, but who knows if, you know, are my room's even going to be here tomorrow? Why do I need to clean it? Right? So it's not necessarily a questioning of authority as we may often take it. It could be that the uncertainty avoidance level is not secure, and so the child is responding to that. We also see an increase in anxious behaviors, um, and the anxious behaviors can manifest in different ways. Um, and I'm, I'm already looking at the time, and I'm like, oh, snap, we have so much to cover, and we're already 25 minutes in. So I'm just going to speed up the conversation a little bit, um, and of course, we'll take questions at the end. But anxious behaviors often are linked also to difficulties with attachment. So we may see children who develop into their teen years with uh, an avoidant or dismissive attachment style, where there is no connection with the person who is in a place of authority or with the foster parent or foster family. Or we might see an anxious attachment where there is a high level of anxiety, where there are almost what would be considered acting out behaviors. But again, those behaviors are linked to the lack of security in that early stage. Now, as we move forward into the age of discipline, which is usually between the ages of eight to 14, my understanding is that there are several um, children within the Michigan community uh, that are uh, forced migrants that are within this age that are being fostered. Um, within this age of discipline, this is often when we see among a collectivist community, which means a community that values the togetherness, a community that focuses on you know, really communal connections rather than individualist connections. We tend to see a difference in terms of the view of family and what power distance looks like. So for instance, often here, because here in the US, we tend to be much more individualist, we may interact with a child and we may say something, you know, like, look at me when I speak to you, right? And that connection of the eye contact would be considered a sign of respect. But of course, in, in a collectivist community where there isn't as much emphasis on the individual, that the looking down may be considered a sign of respect. And so the power distance also the dynamic may change. So within a collectivist community, male authority may be seen as uh, commanding more power. And so there would be a difference in response to male authority, whereas female authority may not be valued as much if it is a, a culture or community that has a differentiation in terms of masculinity and femininity, then the response may be different. We also see the response to discipline differing, right? So remember the attachment that we talked about. If someone has adoptive, a dismissive or avoidant attachment style as a coping mechanism, the response to discipline may be what's interpreted on our end as just not caring, right? Like you can take the phone away and the child still continues to have the same behavior. You can tell the child, you know, you're going to bed without dessert and the behavior may still continue because we often try to use Western paradigms that are very individualistic in terms of how we discipline, which isn't going to work for someone who comes from a collectivist community and someone who has also experienced deep trauma. So shifting the perspective of how we're connecting with the child is very important because coming from a collectivist community, the communal aspect is very important. And we see this, for example, for many of you um, maybe working with Muslim children, you may see, for instance, that um, in practicing the Muslim faith, for example, there is a communal element, right? So prayers in congregation, um, breaking the fast in Ramadan together, um, you know, this, this sense of, if we go back to that first picture that we showed, the sense of family, of connection. Now, imagining, you know, imagine being unanchored and not having that communal sense. 
And remember, we said we're looking at spiritual, psychosocial, emotional, relational well being. And so that spiritual component may be a little off. And that spiritual component, not having the needs met, may cause difficulty in how to respond to the new family dynamic and in the transition. It can also lead to a lack of security in self, and it also leads to that second stage, age 15 to 21, which is kind of term, we use the term the age of advisement during that stage, um, but it can lead to questions of, of identity, questions of belonging, um, not being sure how to define the self, because the self here in the US in an individualist community is defined very differently than the self within a collectivist community. And I want to dive into that a little bit more so that we can understand what to do about it. So within a collectivist community, we see that there is a greater emphasis on the we, not the I, right? Here in the U.S., for example, if we were to take a child to a therapist and, you know, we recognize that the child is struggling with emotion is, you know, and I, I know a few people have mentioned that they are in the field of therapy, um, we take a very individualistic view, meaning the first question we may ask is, you know, how are you feeling? Right. This is common in our in our general conversation. How are you doing? You know, how is it going for you? And this is a very individualist standpoint or perspective. When we look at the collectivist model, we see that there is much more of a thinking of the self in terms of others. So, for example, if we were to take an alternative therapeutic approach, we would want to begin by saying, you know, how are things back in the home country? You know, how is the family doing? Tell me about your friends. And working, you know, several of you may be familiar with Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory, right? The idea that everything is interconnected. But rather than working from the microsystem, which is what we tend to do here in the US in our interactions, we work instead from the macro system. And we begin at the macro system and we work our way down to the micro system. And when we incorporate this approach and how we communicate with the children that we work with, with the families that we work with who come from collectivist communities, it changes the response because now we're speaking the same tongue essentially. And we often talk about how, you know, when it comes to mental and emotional wellness, for instance, we often refer to illness, right? Depression, anxiety, um, a mental illness perspective that we need to solve. It's a problem and we need to fix it as opposed to a mental wellness perspective, which you see the word we in wellness and the I in illness, right? Which is much more of a collectivist or communal journey where in order to build towards wellness, we have to take more of a macro system approach. So again, let's get a little bit more specific in terms of what does this look like. So again, many of you in the fields of social services, human services, social sciences, and psychology are probably familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We know that this theory and this hierarchy came about in the 1940s, I believe, 1943, um, but it's one that roughly is, is used often, particularly in our refugee service provisions here in the U.S. And the idea is that each of our needs, human needs, needs to be met, but needs to be met kind of in a linear structure. We know that this model has been revised in, in recent years, but a lot of times when we're working with forced migrants, and especially forced migrant children, we see a, a similar structure in how we approach it. So first, the physiological needs, right? You, for all of us who are in this field, if we do a food drive, a clothing drive, we tend to see volunteers coming out in droves. We tend to see the donations coming in, right? Because it's something tangible. Let's get a roof over the head of those who have been, you know, through deep trauma due to forced migration. Let's get food to them. Let's make sure that they have a place to sleep, that they are able to take care of those physical needs. And that's the first kind of bar of, of Maslow's hierarchy. Then we often talk about safety, right? Where is the resettlement uh, going to take place? You know, where can we uh, position? What school can we enroll the children in, right? So a sense of safety tends to be next. And again, as service organizations, we tend to do that really well. The next level, love belonging, is what's often defined by what's most familiar to us. So for example, many times in placements of uh, refugee communities, we'll try to find a placement that's close to uh, an enclave or a community or a state or a town in which others from the same country already exist. And so we define love belonging from the idea that, you know, similarities same. But we have a lot of, you know, refugee clients that we work with that 
will struggle with that, that that's not the definition of how they see love and belonging, that they don't want to be in a town or in a community where the people are from the same town or community that they were from uh, back in the country of crisis. Um, and that can be a trigger of its own, that can cause difficulty of its own. So learning how to redefine love belonging, not in the way that we see it, but in the way that the clients that we work with see it. And this goes for children as well. We may try to connect, you know, children who are forced migrants with others who come from the same country or speak the same language. And they, that may not be the best connection because again, that could be triggering, that could be re-traumatizing. So trying to better understand how the love or belonging would be defined by the, the individual that we're serving. The other two elements of Maslow's hierarchy, again, tend to be more individualistic based. So moving towards self-esteem and self-actualization. So many times we push the clients that we work with, like learn English, you know, because once you learn English, you're going to be able to, you know, do your homework on your own. And this may be something that we value as individualists because that concept of self-actualization, depend on yourself, stand on your own two feet, right? This is something that, that we educate our own children on. But coming from a collectivist community, the concept of self-actualization may actually go against the emotional need of self-transcendence, which is, I don't want to depend on myself because it's really lonely having to depend on myself. And so the, the child, for example, who you know, like knows the language or knows how to get on the bus by themselves or knows how to um, do the homework on their own, but they turn to you and say, I don't know how to do this, right? I can't do this. It's not a limit in terms of capability many times. It's often a plea or a bid for a self-transcendence, that collectivist sense of wanting to connect. Again, think of the communal aspects within the Muslim community, for instance, when it comes to prayer, the standing side by side, the connection in terms of building a sense of community um, that's both geared towards spiritual and emotional wellness. So what else might we be seeing in terms of the differences between those who come from a collectivist background and those who come from an individualistic background? Um, so definitely, you know, in our languages, many times we will use terms, for instance, again, and, and we catch ourselves when we learn to look for it, but otherwise it becomes almost a subconscious way of communicating. Um, so we tend to use much more I in our language rather than we. Um, a child, for example, who has gotten in trouble in school, um, the, the person who is disciplining the child may say, you did X, Y, Z. And that's a very individualist centric language, right? Rather than taking an approach of we will figure out together what it is that we need to do to work through this difficulty. And a small change in language in that way, a small shift in terms of how we approach and how we communicate can completely change the dynamic of the relationship between the child coming from a collectivist background and maybe an individualistic uh, foster family that is working with the child. Um, I, I see a question in the Dropbox, so in the chat box. So I'll, I'll take that question and then I'll, I'll keep going. It says, some years ago, I saw many families displaced where their siblings, family members were really put in different states. Has this changed? Also put in situations where there were opposing groups from home country. That is a great question. Um, we did see this uh, in the safe haven. So we had cornerstone interventionists positioned in the different safe havens um, in 2021 when, uh, and early 2022, um, when the uh, Afghan refugee crisis occurred. And within the safe havens, we saw similar situations where um, there were almost like small governance that were created within the safe havens. And the idea was to keep people from similar communities who spoke similar languages within those uh, areas. That caused a lot of difficulty and, and a lot of fight and, and um, problems with it. So what this tells us is that when we talk about collectivism from an emotional relational perspective, oftentimes collectivism is defined more ac uh, according to like familial lines. So when we look at the nuclear family, right, there's mom, dad, the siblings, um, you know, cousins, uncles. So the nuclear family is defined differently than how we might define it here in the U.S. as well, right? Um, and this is why you might see, for instance, a uh, an individual who uh, comes to speak to you and is very upset and says, you know, my uh, my children are here, my mother is here, but my cousin, you know, who's, you know, I don't know, three times removed hasn't come and I need that person to come. That would be a definition of the collectivist extended family there. So to give a shorter answer to this, um, 
in collectivist communities, blood lines tend to be stronger than uh, language lines. Blood lines tend to be stronger than community lines. There can also be a lot of fear of, um, you may have heard this, you know, in, in your communities of, you know, the evil eye or what somebody from my community might look to that I have that they don't have. So there is definitely a difference in terms of definition, but uh, siblings, family members, generally speaking from a collectivist perspective, do tend to want to be together. Um, whereas those from the same community from back home may not want to be together. And so when resettlement agencies do relocate families and, and break the families apart on, along bloodlines, that can cause a lot of difficulty and trauma. But placing families together that are from the same community can also cause trauma. So it's it's a bit of understanding how, not how do we define love and belonging, but how does the individual that we're placing define love belonging? Um, I'll, I'm seeing some more questions, so I'll answer those at the end so we don't, we can keep going a little bit more. Um, power distance is another issue that we see in terms of a difference of expression. And these value dimensions that I'm going over come from um, Gert Hofstede's theory of value dimension and Edward Hall's theory of contextualization. And they help us better understand how people from different cultures interact and react and how they communicate differently. So power distance, we often see that people can have high power distance or low power distance. Here in the US, we tend to have very low power distance, meaning we encourage children to ask questions in class. We tell them, you know, if the teacher says something that's wrong, speak up, right? This push towards a lower power distance, um, especially when it comes to aspects of authority in different situations. In schools, you know, we're encouraging them to speak up. Um, even, you know, in homes, right? We want to have a conversation, which may involve, you know, asking a question and expecting the child to answer. In high power distance communities, which many of the individuals and the youth that we're dealing with coming from forced migrant uh, situations, there tends to be a higher power distance, meaning you don't necessarily question a person who is an authority, but in order to show displeasure, you might just go into what we talked about before, the dismissive or avoidant mode, right? So you may not question, you may not speak up, you may instead simply remove yourself, not respond. And again, we may respond from an individualistic standpoint by saying, talk to me, you know, answer me, uh, tell me what's going on. But a child who has gone into a dismissive or avoidant mode and who views a high power distance may not respond to that. Again, not out of defiance, but out of a difference in terms of communication. Uncertainty avoidance we touched upon, um, but again, essentially we can see it in two different ways. We can see a low uncertainty avoidance where there's no you know, definite uh, absolute or guarantee that tomorrow is going to come. So why would I do anything that's due tomorrow you know, or that needs to be done? Um, and again, we may view it as defiance when it's not defiance, it's a response to trauma and a response to uh, the difference in the cultural transition. Um, or we might see the high uncertainty avoidance, which is linked to anxiety. High and low context also has to do with how we communicate. So here in the US, we tend to be lower contextually, meaning we spell everything out, right? And we like to we like to hear ourselves talk. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of verbal communication. There's a lot of written communication. You know, a homework assignment is often given, you know, I don't know if students use like Schoology or, you know, something that's online. It's also given in paper. It's communicated many times. For many of the children that we work with that come from forced migrant uh, families that are collectivist, um, the contextualism is very high, meaning there's a lot more non-verbally that goes on. And so a lot of the communication that occurs is non-verbal communication, an expression on the face, you know, a, a look in the eyes. And because we tend to be geared much more towards low contextualism, we may not fully be aware of what is happening on the high contextual end of things. Masculinity versus femininity, again, we see a difference in terms of gender roles and gender interaction. We also see a difference in terms of what is happening today in schools and in communities. Um, we know that there is a, a push towards uh, gender nonconformity and gender non-binary approaches, which leaves many of our, our forced migrant children struggling with an understanding of taking a non-binary approach to gender. Because for most uh, youth who come from collectivist backgrounds, gender is very defined and the gender roles are also very defined. 
And it links back a little bit to what we were saying with power distance, that they're in a community in which masculinity is seen as high power distance, right? A position of authority is linked back to more of a masculine sense. Meaning if there is a, uh, a foster mother, for instance, or maybe there is a caseworker or a therapist um, who is female or a teacher who is female, that person may not be given that sense of uh, authoritative, uh, I'm, I'm putting respect in air quotes again, what we might interpret as respect in, in the interaction, because there is a questioning of the gender role and the gender specific uh, aspects that are linked to them. And again, we, we look at many of the communities that come from forced migrant backgrounds and we see that they're, you know, coming to the US, we know this whole melting pot concept, right? Melting pot salad bowl, right? There's a lot of people carrying their own kind of baggage, their own histories, their own cultures. Um, and there's a lot of differences. And we develop this sense of recognizing that the differences exist. But when we have children who are coming from homes in which there is a homogenous culture, a homogenous approach where, you know, people look similar, uh, uh, races, cultures, faith is all similar, the transition can be very difficult. And so being aware of that also helps us better understand that many times it's not defiance, it's it's not disrespect. It's not, you know, purposeful or willful rejection um, of authority or of what needs to be done. It's more a response to the difficulty in transitioning. We also see this when this comes to time. So for many of our, our forced migrant children uh, coming from collectivist communities, we see that they are more polychronic as opposed to monochronic. Meaning, you know, sometimes we will uh, schedule an appointment, for example, or school, we'll use school as an example, um, school starts at 7am or it starts at 8am. So we know that, you know, you've got to be out of the house at like 730 to factor in traffic, or you need to make it to the school bus at this time, right? Because we're monochronic, which means time is a fixed entity for us as individualist, as an individual society. Things start at a certain time and they end at a certain time. For those who are polychronic, which again, many people from collectivist communities are, time is very fluid. So if the bus comes at 8 a.m., there isn't this conceptualization that the bus is just going to leave. It's like, you know, if I'm having a good conversation, if my breakfast is really delicious, if I really need to sleep and I, I'm not ready to wake up as a polychronic person, it may just be that, you know what? it's okay if I miss the bus, right? And it ties back to that uncertainty avoidance as well. The importance that we may place on certain aspects here in the US could look very different for someone that's coming from another country as a forced migrant. All right, so I know I have like a bazillion more slides that we're probably not gonna get to, um, but just in the next couple of minutes before we open it up to q and I'm gonna cover a few more points that I think may be helpful. Um, the intensity of emotions. We will see in trauma responses that the intensity of emotions differ. Again, you may see a child showing extreme negative emotion towards something that you think it's not a big deal, right? And we see this even in children who are not forced migrants, right? When they are not able to emotionally regulate that the responses of emotions may be intense. Now, we want to make sure that how we respond to those emotional responses is also uh, kind of mitigated by a recognition and an understanding of what the child may be experiencing. And we know that school plays a big factor in how these children kind of connect and, and adapt and through that transition. Um, I remember when I first started this, this work in the refugee field, I was like, why was everyone born on January 1st? So many of the, the birthdays would be January 1st. Um, and I didn't realize that for many of the children that come from you know, forced migrant backgrounds, there is no birth certificate. There is no record of when they were born. And so when they come to do the paperwork, January 1st is the date that's most often selected, right? It's just the first of the year. Um, we also see that the year can be off. We've had many children who are placed, for example, in uh, third grade, but in reality, their biological age is age like, you know, 14 or 15, but they're placed in third grade because the birth date correlates with someone who would be a third grader. And so many times within the educational experience itself, we see these differences that are linked to age and to expectations. Many of the children who are forced migrants, you know, did not have consistent school experiences. Um, and so they do experience very intense emotional and academic struggles in that transition. 
And so being able to maybe educate our educators as well on the differences in terms of communication, on the differences of collectivism and what we might expect is, is super important. Of course, we know that the cyberbullying, the in-person bullying, um, the peer pressure, all of that can impact the, the children as well. Um, I'm going to fast forward through some of these slides just because I think the communication component is very important and I want to touch upon it. So many times, you know, when we're communicating with our clients, you know, even after they've picked up maybe the English language in terms of uh, speaking it. And, you know, for many of these children, it's, it, it's, it's always mind boggling. It's incredible to me how quickly they can often pick up the language, um, sometimes out of necessity and sometimes just out of a general receptiveness to the language. But it's not just the language that we see in terms of difference. You know, oftentimes I'll do this exercise where, you know, I, I say the word tree and I'll ask people, you know, what tree do you think of? And so if you all kind of just take a moment and, and think of a tree, right, if we were to have time and I were to ask you what tree you thought of, most likely I would get some of you saying palm tree, an apple tree, an oak tree, and, and pine tree, right, all sorts of different trees. And the type of tree that I may have been thinking of is a willow tree, right? And the reason why I'm thinking of a willow tree is because growing up, I had a willow tree outside of my home. And so that's the image that comes to mind. Now, when we're communicating with children from a collectivist background, right, the, the way that they interpret the words, even if they know the language, is going to be based upon their worldview. So the tree that I see when I say tree may be very different from the tree that they see and how they interpret that. So making sure that we keep in mind through communicating with our, our the, the children that we're working with, that the way that they are going to receive the message is going to depend on how the sender is sending it, but also on their own response, the message itself, and also the channel that it's being sent through. So I'm just going to quickly recommend, if you haven't read um, Gary Chapman's book, The Five Languages of Love, and you work with forced migrants of, of any background, please read it. And I know there's many different, you know, versions of it now, but just the original Five Languages of Love by Gary Chapman, because one of the key elements that we see, particularly with children um, from forced migrant families, is that here in the U.S., in an individualist society, we speak the language of affirmation. So we are all about good job, great work, you know, excellent effort, right? But for most of the children who come from collectivist background, the language of affirmation is not the language that they speak. So instead, they may speak the language of time. They may speak the language of service, which is why the child who says to you, help me with my homework, it's not a bid or a plea because of you know, not knowing how to do it, but because in that way, you are giving them time, and in that way, you are giving them service, right? And that is what the plea is for. Rather than telling the child, great work, you got this, I know you can do it, you're speaking the language of affirmation, whereas they may be speaking a different language. So I think I'm going to probably wrap us up here. Um, I, I will share these slides with the organization. Ah, see, I, I'm always very, I'm polychronic, right? So I always think like, oh, an hour, we've got plenty of time to go through like 60 slides. Um, clearly that's not the case. Um, but maybe this will be, you know, conversation one of many because there's a lot that we can cover, of course, in this topic. Um, I, I think, you know, when we talk about the, just the, the whole concept of uh, fostering and being in this field, we also know that for us as the service providers, we too can go through a great deal of emotional trauma. We too can experience um, re-traumatization and triggers. And so knowing how to help ourselves is incredibly important as well. And I think one of the best ways that we can help ourselves is by educating ourselves, by better understanding the community that we serve, by better connecting with them, um, and by really seeking out you know, our own avenues of connection. Because even though we tend to be more individualistic here, um, in our society, we know that collectivism is a factor of resilience and emotional resilience across communities. So with that said, yes, we have about eight minutes left for question and answer. So I'm going to stop the sharing now um, and just pull up my screen a bit more um, and make the chat box a little bigger. And I'll turn it over to Shona if she has anything to say while I read some of the questions in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ismail. Uh, we are 
just so happy with the presentation and the enlightening tips you're offering here. I know that many, I'm seeing many questions here and I would love, would you like me to read them to you? Do you see them there as well? And I, can, I know you answered the first one. Yes. Yeah. So I see the question. So it's no problem. I can kind of read them and, and talk through them as we move forward, if that's okay. Yes. I think we're on. Can you elaborate a little more on how collectivism approach uh, can be used in self-esteem and self-actualization? Yeah. Excellent. So that's a great question. Um, and I think the first step is it begins with our language usage, you know, um, catching ourselves and seeing, you know, how do we communicate? So something as simple as that, how are you, right? Rather than um, maybe the child comes home from school and our question is, you know, how are you? How was your day, right? Instead, taking a step back and saying, you know, um, tell me what was going on in the school environment today, right? And again, not quite as formal because you're talking to a child, but, you know, taking more of that macro system approach, asking, you know, um, tell me, you know, on the playground today, uh, how were your friends doing, right? So taking rather than our traditional individualist approach, taking more of that, that more collectivist approach. That helps in terms of self-esteem and self-actualization in that we shift the focus from the self to transcendence, right? The whole idea is that we have been kind of cultivating within the individual's perspective that self-esteem and self-actualization are the pinnacle of meeting emotional needs. And the collectivist view rejects that as being the pinnacle, that we don't need to push our, our the children that we're working with towards a place of self-actualization if they are naturally heading more towards self-transcendence. And an example of that is, for instance, creating a big brother, big sister program. Um, it's something that we've done, you know, in, in Cornerstone with the clients we work with, where um, individuals, for instance, who resettled here uh, from Syria in, you know, 2015, 2016, 2017, when we had many of the Afghan refugees resettle here, we partnered them with some of the newly arriving Afghan refugees. And what we did was using that language of service, we would reach out. So for example, we had clients who had resettled many years ago, who still didn't want to get their driver's license, for instance, but we had put them through the driver's school, you know, all of that. So when the Afghan refugees resettled here, we reached out to them and said, hey, you've been through the driving school already. And, you know, even though I know you're not comfortable driving yourself, we have a new uh, refugee client who's here who wants to learn how to do it. Would you be willing to ride in the car as this client goes through the program? And the, the, just the connections that were built was amazing. Again, creating a sense of belonging, not necessarily across language or culture lines, but the empowerment of the uh, Syrian refugee connecting with the Afghan refugee, feeling like they could help. That's the model of self-transcendence that we're talking about. And fostering self-transcendence requires us to shift our perspective. It's not only about self-esteem and self-actualization. That's just the view that we have in terms of what we want our children to reach. All right, so the next question I see, currently we see the emphasis as your truth. How can we address this? We seem to be resistant to directive therapeutic conversations, um, how collectivism is addressed. Okay, so that is probably a whole other hour lecture <laughs> in itself, but I would say just to keep it short, Think about your language. Think about the words that you use. Think about how you are conveying, you know, certain uh, concepts or or ways of communicating. Um, and try to, you know, that that whole inhabiting the skins of others, right? We often talk about being able not just to step into the shoes of someone else, but to literally inhabit the skins of others. And one of the aspects of trauma-informed care is understanding the trauma um, by recognizing the impact that that trauma may have. And again, I would say, you know, education, education, education as much as possible. Okay, um, when we have limited time that children are in our care and they have to be prepared for emancipation after which these young men and women are expected to integrate into the system and face life's challenges and, and competitions here in the US, how can we utilize both collectivism and individualism in our effort to help these youth succeed? Okay, great question. Um, again, time, because we are monochronic, we have this sense that, you know, within 90 days, you know, the, the refugee family will be independent within, you know, 120 days, this milestone has to be marked uh, and reached. We're working with individuals who are polychronic, where time is fluid. It's, it's not going to be seen or viewed in the same way that we see it. 
So I would say, you know, if we can develop more programs similar to what I had mentioned, right, this, this concept of, of transcendence, where we're moving away from the model of dependency on self and instead fostering um, not dependency, but connections, right, fostering connections that can help uplift individuals. And it's not easy and it's not something that's going to change overnight, but I think with these youth, if we can introduce them to programs at the Y, at, you know, big brother, big sister programs, programs that don't, you know, push the isolation, that could be a step in the right direction. Um, okay, thank you so much for the nice comment that I, I see in the chat box next. Um, all right, a lot of staff in placement agencies are females and they face the challenge of what they perceive as not being respected or someone doesn't accept their authority. What can be some ways that we enable them to provide care and discipline within this context? Okay, wonderful question. Um, and again, it goes back to the masculinity versus femininity and the power distance that we talked about. Again, if we are to inhabit the skins of others, understanding the view of gender um, that the child is coming with, right? And the view of what does a, a gender appropriate role look like? Um, a lot of it is not about utilizing discipline techniques or authoritative techniques that we may use here in the US. So for example, here in the US, we're taught that if we wanna be authoritative, we wanna make sure that we have steady eye contact. We wanna make sure that our voice is strong, that we use certain language. Um, and there's a bazillion books out there, you know, and, and how to communicate in order to be respected. And I would probably say that every one of those uh, bits of advice in those books would be rejected by someone coming from a collectivist community. So the way that we want to express ourselves, regardless of the gender, has to shift a little bit, right? So if the, the eye contact, for example, of the child, and, and we often talk about mirroring the nonverbals, if the eye contact for the child is one in which the eyes are lowered as they're communicating, being able to mirror that, right? So being able to, you know, maybe make an initial eye contact and then not sustain the eye contact because the sustained eye contact actually is seen more as a challenge rather than as a, a sense of connection or a sense of creating respect. If the child, for example, is sitting uh, forward, you know, you mirror that seating and sit forward as well. If they're sitting back, then you mirror that seating. Um, if the child is standing, you stand. So mirroring nonverbal cues actually increases is the level of, you know, again, I, I keep using respect in, in quotation marks because even the meaning of respect is different from a collectivist perspective as opposed to an individualist perspective. So shifting the focus rather than discipline and respect, focusing instead on connecting and uplifting, right? And when we do make those connections, particularly non-verbally, because we're dealing with highly contextual individuals rather than low context individuals, it's not going to be what we say, it's going to be how we say it. And again, this is probably another like full day session in which we talk about how to communicate non-verbally in order to be most effective with individuals from collectivist communities. Right, I see one last question, so I'll try to dive into that in the last minute or so. Um, are there any tips for us as we endeavor to bring more families as resource parents, uh, um, it says former parents from the Islamic community, I'm guessing it means foster parents. Uh, what language do we as presenters speak, not hurting their cultural religious sentiments, but at the same time serving our children in appropriate homes? Um, yes, I see that it's associated foster, not former. Um, so I feel like that question is probably better answered by the organization because the organization um, MCA does work on MCFA, I believe, right? Uh, Muslim Community Foster Association um, does work on uh, promoting the concept of fostering. Um, I will tell you, you know, when we look at spiritual, psychosocio emotional wellness, in a secular, secular society, we often leave out the spiritual. And it's such an important component, particularly for collectivist community. So not losing sight of the spiritual. So rather than fostering being something that is transactional, being able to create fostering um, and, and align fostering with the spiritual experience of connecting. And when we're able to create that link, it reflects in how people foster as well as the willingness um, to foster. Mm -hmm. So I will wrap it up here. Yep. Yep. I think that was the last. Any any more questions? I think that's it. Yep. Well, th thank you, Dr. Ismail. Um, like I said, it was very informative, excellent, and just uh, very enlightening for me to hear you speak and. I, I definitely think we all got some hands-on tips that we could implement right away from the models you shared 
from your expertise and background. We were very grateful to have you here with us today. And I, and I think we definitely need you to come back on some of those questions and, and hopefully you can join us again, uh, you know, some other time. Yeah. Thank um, you very much. No, thank you so much. And, and again, like I said, I'm polychronic. So I always have this thought that I'm going to do so much more in an hour than I really can do. But I'll definitely share the slides as someone in the chat had asked. Oh, yes. That's right. Thank you. We will be sending out the recording of the presentation and the slides for everyone to review. And inshallah, we'll hope to have Dr. Susie back uh, for, for maybe a series. Um, I think this was insightful, incredibly, um, you know, just informative. And so many questions that you addressed here, um, you know, we're seeing day to day in our work with foster youth. So thank you everyone for being here. And thank you so much, Dr. Susie Ismail. And we hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. And feel free to email our office if you have any other questions that come up related to the presentation. Yeah, we'll share mm -hmm. Cornerstone and Dr. Susie's information as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you.